1813. Um, we're in the post victory, I guess. I'm not sure if I were playing with someone, I might well be chancing it here too. So here's what the situation stands at right now. In order for France to win, first of all, there's nothing left. Um, the Brits have no troops and they have nothing they can get uh, unless they get cards to help them. Uh, Wellington is in the failed box. Russians are out of the game right now. Uh, Austria's conquered. So all that's left is Prussia, Sweden, and Portugal. The Spaniards can probably take the Portuguese out. Things might get tricky if they can't. Uh, Prussia, well, it's a major power. It's only going to get two counters, though, if it's attacked during the turn. So it won't be too hard. But you'd rather not do it. But Sweden is impossible for the French to actually take. So they're going to have to use diplomacy somehow. And they happen to have the Napoleon card, which allows them to take Sweden um, and convert it into a neutral country. I don't know if that's enough because... Movement-wise, they're still going to have to capture Sweden. They're allowed to move there now. They're going to have to capture Prussia, which is going to be kind of tough, and they're going to have to take Portugal. Between the three of them, it's really risky. I think I probably would have taken the, the uh, minor victory. But anyway, this is the post-game attempt to win anyway, to win bigger. Uh, the coalition opens up the turn by dropping peace talks which make the first uh, two campaigns phases disappear. That makes the job a little harder on the French. Um, we got the setup here. Pulled the Vu up with uh, the veterans card. And uh, we're planning on taking Sweden at this point, Portugal next, and then moving on to Prussia at the end. That may not work now. French made up for the peace talks. Nothing happened during them by playing a major campaign. Um, so they launched their attack in Portugal, took Sweden, and an attack in Prussia. Result of the French attacks. Well, they won in Brandenburg and totally destroyed the enemy using a cav charge. They used uh, combined arms over in Portugal, and they didn't work quite so well. Uh, Beresford managed to escape, and that's putting Madrid in, at risk. French moved Eugene from Italy all the way to Madrid. One, two, three. Uh, that covers that, and will force Beresford to make an attack on Portugal, probably. Beresford did retreat, uh, and then he came back and attacked again, and he was destroyed on another retreat due to attrition. That was really a crapshoot, the attacks, um, and actually the Spanish probably should have let him go take Spain, or because France was holding the no-surrender card, which would have ensured them a victory if they went that route. As it is, they got the victory anyway, but none of it counts because... We were playing uh, just a make-believe at this point. All right, so that's it. Um, I'll give the wrap and review in a minute. Okay, so Age of Napoleon. Um, for what it is, I really, really like this game. Uh, it's not quite what I was looking for. I think I was looking for something just a little bit heavier in terms of being more of a war game, more of a strategic uh, options, etc. But the mechanics for this are really beautiful. I, the game designer comes up with something where he says uh, one of his choices to make it a two-player game was in order to preserve sort of the historical uh, outcomes or, or at least the alliances. That worried me at first, and what I'm seeing now is that those uh, those outcomes are every bit as 
uh, flexible and fluid a, a, as they are in any other game, including Empires and Arms, which is probably the game with the most fluid uh, diplomacy type rules. Uh, War and Peace, well, that I know of. Uh, <laughs> I haven't looked at, I, I know there's another CDG uh, and a more conventional one. Uh, components are beautiful. Phalanx makes wonderful components. Um, the rules, I don't like the glossy, high-value component type rules. First of all, they tend to be uh, lacking in terms of clarity in the sense that, you know, I open up a legalese-looking rule book and it fixes my mind into a certain state. When I open up a rule book like this, and it's got kind of some sort of image in the background, and it's a little glossy, so there's a shine. But most of all, everything's, here's the rule, here's an example, here's a special rule. Nothing's indexed, nothing, I mean, there's a numerical system, but it's just not, uh, it, it, it's, it's not as, coherent to me, so it actually took a couple of readings to get through what are pretty damn simple rules. Another thing, color. That distracts me when it's in the rules. <laughs> yeah, I know, a lot of people uh, want the flashy rules. I love the flashy components. I love, uh, not flashy, I love the components, and I think they're just high quality uh, that Phalanx puts out. These beautifully colored maps, that are uh, just really, really tastefully done. There's no gloss on them. There's no, uh, no annoyance factor to them. They don't look silly. They're just very pretty. Um, this was a very simple map. Very, very, uh, not a lot of areas in it. The only complaint I have there is uh, the differentiation between what's a barren area and what's not. I would suspect there were a few times where that didn't affect attrition where it normally would. Uh, <laughs> another tiny gripe, uh, standardized counter trays that, I don't know, look like they're made for no game and every game and they have spots for dice and this, that, and the other. And frankly, they don't fit with this particular game. I don't want to take it out and throw it away, but I'm going to put the pieces in bags like I always do, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a minor thing. This is a really good game. Um, I would say probably about two hours, uh, which I think, again, that's a little lighter than I was hoping for. Um, nice, nice move putting the cards out. They're a little flimsy, but, you know, they're rough. Uh, it's really good to have player aids like that that compile all the charts. And they actually have the rules in them in a, in a somewhat more readable fashion, maybe because of the, the lack of glare on them. Uh, counters are absolutely gorgeous. The play of the game is very simple. One thing that I love, this is, so I, I'm not a big fan of most CDGs. I think. It's hard to tell. I kind of like all the ones I have, even Twilight Struggle, which I definitely had less than great things to say about. Um, but I think there's something about the system as a whole that bothers me very, very deeply. In this game, the only other game that... There was a break. Sorry about that. The only other CDG that really, really... I fell in love with completely was Here I Stand. With this one, um, I think I, I have as well, but I think the very light nature of this game has made it particularly good uh, for that format. And I, I kind of wonder, um, there's a few things. One, single deck, I like single deck a lot. Uh, the fact that, uh, um, that there are a lot of cards that you don't want to particularly play. Uh, situationally, they might be very valuable at certain times, but in general, you just don't care. Um, makes it very easy to use them. There's no reason that you want to play a card other than the game situation that you're in right now. 
uh, you're going to lose your hand, so there's no reason to hold cards. Uh, you, you can't trim the deck, you can't do any of that gamey stuff that maybe can be defined in some of the other games. Maybe it can be rationalized, but I have a hard time doing it. And it certainly doesn't come to me intuitively. Um, the other fact, every card's basically worth one point. Whatever one point is, you know, they're like money. Uh, they're just, you can either do an event or you can do an action. And if you run out of cards in, in your campaign phase, that probably means you did a lot of really cool stuff because especially as the French or as the coalition, if you're doing well, um, you end up with a pile of cards, a good sized hand. And most of them you don't really want to use. And if you're not doing well, you probably don't have a lot of armies on the board. The one turn where uh, Prussia, Russia, and England were all trying to fight against France. That was the one time when I felt like I had a little bit of a disadvantage by having so few cards for the coalition. Uh, I'm sure if France gets cut back, they're really going to be unhappy with their lack of cards because they need to take actions at that time, I would assume. And, and, and it's a similar event. Anyhow, I really think that the lighter nature of the game makes it more appealing for these cards. Games that had events before uh, even just shit events or whatever, usually, nah, Russia, <laughs> notwithstanding, but with event cards especially, they tended to be lighter games, things like Empires uh, of the Middle Ages. Um, there's a lot of luck to this game. I like that. <laughs> the hand you draw can really, really vitally change what you can do in a turn. The die rolls on the combat tables um, the combat table doesn't change a lot, but who wins and who loses a battle is huge, and that's decided by one loss. Uh, and so there's a lot that can hinge on getting lucky, uh, being able to call uh, a turn short by reducing it by a couple of campaigns. It, these are big events that can, that can, you know, potentially win or lose you the game at that point. And I really like that. Uh, I can see where some people really wouldn't. Anyway, overall, I tried to figure out my rating. It keeps, it spans somewhere between a 6 and an 8, so I'm going with a 7. On the 6 side is because I tend to give lighter games lower ratings, but this definitely deserves more than that at this point. Um, I don't think it's quite earned the 8 range, just because... Uh, eh, it is really light, you know? And the really light games that I have given high ratings to are ones that I've loved and, and gone back to the well to again and again. I'm thinking things like uh, awful green things. Go gets a 10. Uh, yeah, once upon a time. Um, and there aren't a lot of games that I've given 9s and 10s to. I kind of rate on a bell curve rather than linearly. Most people at Board Game Geek seem to rate as, oh, I like the game, so it's a 9 or a 10. Uh, it's an okay game, so it's like a 7 or an 8. <laughs> I really dislike it, so it's a 6. Or, it's of a genre I don't like, so I'm going to rate it really, really crappy. I find, I find the ratings over there totally useless, but I'm putting my ratings on there anyway just because I'm that kind of guy. All right, enjoy.